name is Mary Sulerud. I'm canon for Congregational Vitality in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. And this is one of a series, a five-part series called On Ministry. It's a series about ministry of all the baptized, lay and ordained. Today, I am in conversation with the Venerable Ruth Elder, who is Archdeacon for the Diocese of Maryland. And welcome, Ruth. It's good to have you here. Welcome, Mary. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So let's begin with the thing that we do all the time as Episcopalians, which is throw words around that we think everybody knows what they mean when it comes to ministry and have not a clue. Mm -hmm. So I called you the Venerable, which was the correct <laughs> title, yes? Yes, that's correct. And that's associated with being an archdeacon. So who is, what is an archdeacon? Okay, thanks, Mary. So as you mentioned, the Venerable is just, is just my title. It's instead of Reverend Deacon Ruth Elder, it's the Venerable because of being archdeacon. As the archdeacon, I serve the diocese and the deacons here for the deployment, so their assignment to parishes. I take care of their pastoral care. I meet regularly with the bishop to talk about the services that we offer throughout the diocese. And I keep an eye on the deacons to see who's serving where, if it's time for someone to retire. I work with that person. If it's time for a new assignment, I work with them, the new assignment. I work with priests who are interested in congregations who are interested in having a deacon serve with them. And also when I go out to um, churches with the bishop, I talk a little bit about the deacon ministry and, and what we do and what we can do for the church and for the congregation and for our communities. So that's who Ruth is today. Mm -hmm. So I wanna scroll back a little bit and talk about ministry. Mm. And I wanna, I, I find myself falling into a trap often when I'm talking particularly with children mm. that explaining that when they're kind and when they love each other and when they love one another and when they look out for their siblings or they're careful about what they say to mom and dad or a teacher as an act of kindness, that that's ministry. I don't think that's wrong, mm -hmm. but I do think that that may be selling it a bit short. So what I want to do, beginning with you, is talk a bit about when in your life might you have been doing something or reflecting upon something when you realized that what you were about was not simply, oh, I'll be nice to Jeff over here because he's having a tough day, or um, Julie over here because her dad just died, but something else was in play. Mm -hmm. God was at work. So could you share an experience of when that got more palpable, clearer for you? Yeah, I, I think, like you said, it's really hard to, to begin to talk about ministry because from a young age, I was always raised to not only take care of myself and family members, I'm an only child. So we were often uh, with my grandmothers going to our aunt's house and, and helping out there or my grandmother was at a funeral and helping, or I grew up in the church and I began to, to help other people. But I think it became clear to me that it was about a ministry when it was not just affecting me and the person that I was helping or I was working with. Um, also because it wasn't a job. It was just, it was so natural. It was uh, organic, as they may say, that you were offering the gift that you had to someone else freely without expecting someone or something back in return. And that you could see a change or a light in someone that uh, was unexplainable, that, that you understood that it was a gift from God and that other people also saw it. So I think it was something that just affected not just me and the person, but also the community in some way in demonstrating love and care, uh, in demonstrating uh, unselfish sharing, so to speak. Um, and I think that's when it became more of a ministry. And then when other people began to ask, well, you did so well with, with Mary, would you, would you go and, and visit Chris? <laughs> I was thinking, it was just, 
you know, God just asked me to go visit Murray, and I did. And now I'm visiting Chris. And so then it became even bigger than just the two of us. It blossomed in something that spread from us to other people in our worship community or people outside of the church. So often we think of ministry just inside of, of our buildings, but people who don't come to our churches, when we go to someone's house, sees us and say, oh, they're church members, they're Christians, they worship together. And so that's how I think ministry spreads, or one way. Were you raised in the church, or, or were you part of the church your whole life? I have been, I was raised Episcopalian, yes. I, so I've been part of this church my whole life. But my grandmother's Christian science, so I was also part of her church. My other grandmother is Baptist, so I was part of that church. And not let me say church, but denomination. Mm -hmm. Because church is, is, is all of it. It's, it's all of us who are called to service of God. And so church is broader than just a specific denomination. So yes, I was brought up in the church, the church of God, all of my life. Um, and even when I fell away and wasn't attending an Episcopal church, I was still in the church somewhere, um, seeking God and, and worshiping. And working it through. And working it through, yeah. So in your life, you felt called to ordain the ministry, and specifically that of a deacon, what, what shifted in your life mm. that moved you in that place? So, uh, ooh, that's, a, that's kind of a tough question. Um, I still reflect on that even today. So, as I said, I've always been a part of the church um, youth group lay Eucharistic minister serving at the altar, uh, Sunday school teacher, vestry, um, it, almost anything that went on in the church, uh, church women's group, mm -hmm. you know, I was there. So I've always been um, one that has been helpful to other people and, and called to acts of service. Uh, typically, I like to stay behind the scenes. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's where I'm the most comfortable. But I think the call to the diaconate to ordain ministry really came from outside of me, from other people mm -hmm. who would see me uh, with someone or, or see me just be in a space and said, have, have you considered the diaconate? And I was like, no, not really. I just, you know, <laughs> I'm doing what God is calling me to do because I, I, I learned when I was young that, um, that I had gifts that God had given me that I wanted to share, and that when I was obedient to the leading of the Spirit, things went well, even if I didn't think I was capable of doing something, uh, if I didn't think I was capable of comforting someone, if I didn't think I was able or worthy to lead a class, God, God made that work. So the idea of ordained ministry really came from other people saying to me, I see this aspect in you. And my ability to be unselfish about it um, also led me to consider ordained ministry. Uh, oddly enough, the final thing that, that led me to ordain ministry was really filling out the application for exploring baptismal ministry. Hmm. When that happened, it happened so smoothly and effortlessly that I knew I was on the right path. Hmm. And others around me supported me in that ministry when I finally uh, made that confession that I think this is what I want to do. So it's, it's sort of like baptism where you actually say, I believe in God or the confirmation and, and this is what I want to do. When I actually verbalized that I think I'm seeking ordained ministry and so many people said, well, what took you so long? <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm on the right path. Because I was happy being a lay person and, and serving. Um, but it was, it was the community that really helped me along that path. So say more about, you told us what an archdeacon does, and, mm -hmm. it, it, and it's a particular kind of um, leadership role, you mm -hmm. know, among the deacons and on behalf of the bishop. Mm -hmm. But say more to us about the ministry of the deacon because I think it's not really still very well understood mm -hmm. in any tradition, and, and it's been revived in several. 
Yeah. So the ministry of the deacon for me um, begins with the work that we've already started doing in the church and outside in the community. I'm really drawn in some cases to not only just what we do here, but Christ worked out in the world. You know, once he got his disciples together, he took them out to work in the community. So I was often um, not only thinking about the people in the church, but the people outside of the church and, and how we could help them and collaborating with, with other people. So as a deacon, I have the opportunity to do that. In the church is, is simple, um, fairly simple. Liturgically, I set the table, I proclaim the gospel, and I give the dismissal. Uh, we're full and equal order with priests. You know that I'm the deacon because my soul goes across my chest, which actually leaves my hands free to work. My work in the, in the world, um, as I said, deals with the community, the community around our churches, uh, the people that we encounter around our churches far and near. I absolutely believe that um, it's not just about this zip code and this city, but it's also the state and the world. So as deacons, we work immediately with the community outside of the doors of our churches, but some deacons are global, some deacons mm -hmm. are, are advocates. Um, we're all trying to work with people to present Jesus to them and then bring them in to Christ's love. All people won't become Christians because they see us working with them, but they will know that Christ was there. So we believe we're Christ's hands and Christ's feet in the world, helping those that are hurting, helping those that are suffering, and really trying to seek social justice in various ways, mm -hmm. whether it's hands-on, working in a food pantry, or with joblessness, or with those people who are unhoused, or advocacy. Some of us are really into organizations such as working with bills, like we do here at the cathedral, or going to Annapolis and um, speaking out or giving testimony about a bill or just showing up to a place where they're discussing, even in your community, where they're really talking about how one person is treating another one justly or unjustly. So that's where you'll find deacons. So lots of places. <laughs> so before you came to the cathedral, where were you? You've served in, I know, at oh, least one other place. Yes. So, so uh, I was ordained in 2015 mm -hmm. as a, to the diaconate, and my first uh, parish was the Church of the Holy Nativity in Pimlico. It's a small, what some might call storefront church, untraditional church building, small mm -hmm. congregation. When I served there, I served at the local food pantry. I also served as a volunteer at the local rehab mm -hmm. facility, um, a place that was maybe four blocks away. And I was a participant in the local oh wow, community organization. They had like a Park Heights community organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also the police department, because of the neighborhood, which could be scary at times, I thought it was important for that police connection. So I made contact with the um, police department there. And they joined us for a prayer walk one day. One of, the, one of the police came up and joined us. So at the Church of the Holy Nativity, uh, the congregation and I, as I said, supported the food pantry when I was at the rehab center. We went to the rehab center and um, shared Christmas with them, sang songs, cooked the children that we had. So those were some of the types of things. Um, I also walked the neighborhood. One of the things that I like to do is to walk the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, the couple of blocks around, just to get to know our neighbors. And on one occasion, if I can share, I, I did run into a young lady that uh, was in need of some assistance, and so I invited her to, do, to the church. I mean, we offered assistance, um, and I gave it to her freely, and she said thank you, and she said, I've always been kind of scared to come in here because, you know, wow. people treat you differently. And I said, well, no, come to church. You know, one day when you feel like it, just, just come on in. And so eventually, um, after a couple of more weeks of, you know, just waving and saying hi, she came in. And 
after a couple of more weeks of, you know, peeking in, she came in and she joined us for repast afterwards. And then she became an active participant of the parish. But there's also been plenty of people that I've passed on the street and said hello to or we offered assistance to who did not become members. Mm -hmm. But they knew the love of Christ and, and they knew there was someone there that cared about them as a person and, and listened to them, heard them, asked them their name. I was struck the couple of times that I've been to um, Holy Nativity in Pimlico to be um, the preacher and the presider on those days. Mm -hmm. um, that that's a congregation of people who can both support it because they can give treasure and time mm -hmm. and people who support it because they walk in the door. Yes. And mm -hmm. are as in as much of need of what the church can give them in so many other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they give they give by being accepted and by being who they are. I, I'm really struck by the dynamic in that congregation that is so accepting that you don't see the difference. Yeah, it's, it's a very loving congregation. Everyone gives, everyone gives something. Yes. Um, whether it's serving as usher at the front door, whether it's when someone comes in helping them with the prayer book, whether it's um, doing our uh, coffee hour, we actually serve a meal yeah, after, each, <laughs> after each service. There's a group that serves a meal after each service, but maybe a person's job is, is simply clearing the table yep. or making sure someone has juice. Everyone there participates in some way doing something. Yep. Yeah. Um, no matter how small, how large, it, it, it really doesn't matter. And that is the beauty and the strength, I think, of that particular parish. Um, they're not rich, many of them are not rich financially, but their hearts are full. And they give what they can. As I mentioned, we support the food pantry um, at the Lutheran Church up the street. So I encouraged all of our members to bring something. Hmm. And all of our members bring something. Yeah. No one can say, I don't have anything I can bring. Everyone, and, and I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with some people, and so that might have been helpful also, but everyone has something they can bring. Mm -hmm. One can, one prayer. I, I mean, prayer was another thing that I said, you know, your gift is really praying for people, or your gift is, is really about sending people cards. I had one lady who her her gift, her love, her joy came from, if you were sick, being able to send you a card. Mm. And she was faithful in making sure that Sister Mary had a card and please mail this to her. Yeah. And so that was the beauty and the gift I found uh, in that particular parish. Also in welcoming the community, once or twice a year, we had, um, once a year, we had homecoming. And we went outside, we opened the doors, we had food, and the community was welcome to join us. Mm. So that was another point of outreach. Um, several times when I was there, we had sing-alongs. Mm. And we did it out in front of the, the church. And we sang songs from the hymn books, and people walked up, and we'd ask, well, what would you like to sing? And so they would say, <laughs> you know, if we could find it, if you, if you can lead it, we can join you. Um, and so we, we did that. The building next door was uh, available. We had an organization, Sisters Saving the City, who, yep. who had youth programs there in, in that building. Um, during the National Night Out, we went, had a service, opened the doors. We did part of it outside. Um, so that we were part of the commun that community effort for a National Night Out where we were one church that was open and the church up the street was open and the community center was open. And so, you know, my presence there, I think, actually helped us to be more in the community and be a little bit more visible because they identified me with that parish and the people of that parish. Mm -hmm. And then when we came out, you know, the people came out. Interesting. And it also, I think, for me, 
made me feel a little bit safer mm -hmm. because they knew who I was. I mean, I never did get to play horseshoes with the gentleman next door, but <laughs> we often did say hello when they were out there. So, so that was one of the churches. The other churches I served at was the Church of the um, Holy Trinity, which is my home parish. Mm -hmm. I spent a little bit of time there. Um, there, one of our things was the James Mosier Baseball League, which was down the street, yes. which we supported um, financially. We, we had our own team with our name on, on their jerseys, and that was a great gift. Um, the women and the men there, the church, we supported the elementary school when it was open, and that was a real secret um, that we supplied them with book bags and meals you know, during the week. That was something that they did, the groups did, but they really didn't, you know, share a lot or make a big deal out of it. Uh, we had fish fries, and eventually, uh, <laughs> before I left, we had a big community day mm -hmm. outside and, and gave book bags and brought in different organizations to share information. Pratt Library, the zoo, the police department, the attorney general's office, so... Uh, that was my second church. And then I was assigned here to the cathedral. So that's some of the work <laughs> so that I've been able to do. Let me center in this space because yes, there are a couple of things I know that you've gotten very involved in. Mm -hmm. The first thing I want to talk about is after we had the close down for COVID and close down of the sanctuary so it could be um, painted and worked on, Mm -hmm. and rehabbed, you resurrected the Children of Light altar. Mm. So could you say a bit about what that is? Because um, I know it's very near and dear to the hearts of people here. Mm -hmm. And also how that came to you to begin to focus on that. OK. Um, it was a godsend, mm. <laughs> really. I realized that um, the cathedral had many gifts, many things that they, they had done. And when I heard about the Children of Light altar, mm -hmm. which is one that used to be in the left side of the church, um, I used to pray, go and pray for the children of Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, a big uh, marcher, you mm -hmm. know, get out there, rah, rah kind of person. Uh, prayer would be more my thing in that, that space. and so. Um, praying with the children of, uh, of light and remembering those children who died of homicide just struck a chord with me. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a mother of two children. My, both of my children are foster parents. And I also know the struggles of children that go unnamed and unheard mm -hmm. when they're hurt and they're hurting. And homicide is just one part of the life of children that have been mistreated, maybe in some kind of way. Maybe they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. But often that is caused by family members or friends. And I also realized that there are so many children that die that probably aren't even reported as homicides. It was an accident or whatever. Um, and so that was really my drawing to the, my, what drew me to the Children of Light altar and resurrecting that. Um, in doing a little research, I find that that's um, something that we've had here back in the 90s. Yep. I think along yep. with the Peace Garden um, mm -hmm. and the, the statue out there, I call it a statue with the lion and the lamb, yeah. you know, uh, the lion and the lamb and a child shall lead them. And so that's really what drew me to the the Children of Light altar. God just said, you know, he really just put that on my heart. And I vocalized, well, why don't we redo this? And I offered myself to be able to, to look up and to remember those children e each week. Uh, and I think, actually, Mary, that's how so many of my ministries has, have come to me. Um, I, I'm in a space and God speaks to me however God speaks to one and says, I want you to do this. I totally get that. <laughs> <laughs> I totally so, 
totally get that. I totally get that. And I just that. follow yeah. through. Yeah. And I right. can't explain, you know, somebody, well, how do you, I, I can't explain it other than to say that when I feel as if it is something that God is leading me to do, it happens effortlessly. And it is generally welcomed, um, not only by the leadership of the church, but also the members. Because again, I'm about community. Mm -hmm. So our community of believers in some way uh, get the message to me, oh, I'm so glad to see that. And that's the thing that helps me to continue, I must say. Uh, as deacons, we are unpaid. This is a vocation with no stipend. Right, right. Um, but to have someone in passing say, oh, I appreciate that you did that. Mm -hmm. It's a small thank you, but, you know, they said it, we moved on. Uh, that's how I know that I'm on, I'm on the right track. And I found, for me, that when I resist that leading of the spirit, that it keeps nagging. Mm, yes, <laughs> yes. I was going to say, God's usually in for a fight if God wants something, me to do yeah, something I'm not it, ready to do. Yeah, yes. if, it's, if it's something I need to do, you'll, it'll just come back because I'll say, oh, no, I'm not ready for that, or no, I can't do that, or I'm too busy, or it's not important. It's a little thing. Who missed it? I mean, really, who missed it? But me, but it was, it's important. I think to this community and to those children to be remembered, those unknown children to be remembered. So for me, it's a justice issue, mm -hmm. but it's also bigger, it's, it's a God thing. Um, well, and it threads itself through the, the life of the service when we mm -hmm. remember one of those children in our prayers, because we mm -hmm. don't just speak their name, right. which is we know now in um, terms of racial justice, ministry is so critical mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. the name mm -hmm. but we also light a candle mm -hmm. because and carry that through our prayers and out and to that altar and mm -hmm. and for me that's always this incredible sign that whatever happened that that child died that child's light is not extinguished yes and i think the other piece of that is is also recognizing that as as a people we all attach to different things. Mm -hmm. Some people, it's just seeing the name. Some people, I'm visual. Seeing that candle mm -hmm. helps me maybe to pray for that child, but also maybe pray for someone else or do something for someone else um, or to be able to touch the, the, the candle and when, I'm, when it's at the altar. I know that some people do like to touch things. So I think it also engages all of our different senses and, and touches everyone in a, in a very different way. And it's a powerful reminder because I remember last year when we brought all the candles forward because mm -hmm. at the beginning of Advent, we start, in a sense, all over, over again, again because that's mm -hmm. the beginning of our church year. Mm -hmm. But we brought the candles up and I remember there was some anxiety because I was, on, I was serving that day that there wasn't going to be enough room. room. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, think about that. Just think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, that there, there are that many. Yes. And mm -hmm. um, it, it really brought it home to me. For me, not just about the children, but all the adults, mm -hmm. young adults young usually adults. too, mm -hmm. who, are about, who also have died, who are part of that. Yeah systemic violence in this mm -hmm. city. Yeah, and the, the children of light that, that we um, recognize right now are those children under 17 and under. Right. I also keep a, a personal list of those that are age 18, because they're right on the cusp. Right. I mean, at, at my age, they're all children. But, um, <laughs> you know, so, so there's that group there. But as you said, you think about the children you think about their family and friends. I, I think about the other children they attend school with. Oh, yes. I think about the children who were around them and witnessed that murder. Mm -hmm. Or adults. I mean, that's traumatic. To watch, to watch a person die is traumatic. But to watch a child die, I think just adds a different layer to it. Uh, and in some cases, I, I will say that in, in looking, uh, not only putting their, their name in the bulletin, but looking 
up information about these children. Some of them are really celebrated, if I can use that word, by their communities. Mm -hmm. So there were prayer vigils, there were memorials placed for these children. Not, so not just were we recognizing them, but their communities were recognizing them. And so that just continues, as you said, that thread of people who recognize this loss of life and what may have caused uh, the system or whatever to break down that, that this child died. That this happened. Mm -hmm. That this happened, yeah. So let me, I know you haven't been a deacon, you know, <laughs> oh. in, in this way in terms of length and years, mm -hmm. but certainly in experiences, they're pretty rich. Yeah. So as a way of kind of closing this, what oh. in your mind, what's changed in ministry for you? What's the same, what's different? What's the same and what's different? I'd say what's the same is, um, that's a tough question, outside of the doors. That um, I think in, in this season, particularly with COVID, that people have become more sensitized, I want to say, to not only their needs and the needs of others, but that there's such an abundance mm. that there's not scarcity. That, right. as you said, with the children of light, you know, you brought up those 30 or 40 and you thought it wasn't enough, but there's more than enough. There's always there was, room. There's always room. Um, and so I think the, what's different right now is that some people have recognized that there's, there's more than enough, that I am worthy and I have something I can give. And that my gift is not like Mary's or John's mm -hmm. or, or someone else's, but that I can do something. And that creatively, it could be anything. I mean, I think about the fact that we're doing live stream, yeah. <laughs> which a year or two ago, they would have never even yes, imagined. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they would not. We tape the sermons, you know, yes. We're taping sermons. We're, we're reaching people that aren't even in the zip code or this city or this state. Um, I'm, I've traveled mm -hmm. throughout the state. My mother loved going places, and we were always taking our children places. So I, I, I understand the, the breadth of Maryland and the United States. And so I think that's the other thing that's different now is that we really get and understand that it's not just about us, that it's about us. Mm -hmm. And so I think that might be the difference. So I want to thank you, Ruth, okay. for this conversation, okay. for um, being a light <laughs> in ministry in mm -hmm. so many different places and especially here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Amen. And that's it.